Um, yeah, so I'm going to probably talk a little bit about myself as we go through the, the week. Uh, for now, I'm MI Justin on Twitter, and you don't have to do this with me, but just to, so you know, when speakers are up here, if you mention them while you're watching, you know, hey, th that was a good quote or anything, just that's a great way to show some love for the people up front. Here's a little bit of history about me. I, uh, I've been doing SAS for 10 years, started in 2008 when I was 28 years old. Uh, in 2015, I wrote a book called Marketing for Developers. Has anyone read that? Anyone here? Oh, nice. Whoa. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, that allowed me to go full time as a solopreneur in 2016. And I can remember wanting to do that forever like listening to Mike and Rob in my car while I was driving an hour to work and being like, I can't wait till I can go independent. And that happened two years ago. And this year, I'm building a, a brand new podcast hosting application with my buddy John. I'll tell you a bit more about that later. But this is the title I gave my talk, an unconventional way to validate your product idea. And you might have looked at that and gone, well, what's so unconventional about it? And I'm going to tell you, but to illustrate it, I want to tell you a story. You guys okay with the story right now? Yeah. All right, let's tell the story. I started snowboarding in 1995, 15 years old. Anyone here snowboard too? All right, put your hands down. How many skiers we got here? Lame. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> so I started snowboarding in 1995, um, and almost immediately, I started dreaming, look at that punk kid there, a little 15-year-old Justin, frosted tips. Um, almost immediately, I started dreaming about opening my own snowboard shop. And in 2003, made that dream happen. I opened a snowboard shop with three friends, sorry, two friends. And this was a huge mistake. Um, this is our grand opening announcement. What is this? May 1st, 2003 was our grand opening. The real deal. And in 2005, we closed the shop. And I don't know, if, has anyone here been in retail before? I don't, you don't realize how much money it takes to start a shop, even a little one. And once we'd gotten rid of all of our unused inventory, paid suppliers, paid employees, paid to get out of our lease, all those things. Uh, I was $85,000 in debt. I was 25, and it really sucked. And I wanted to tell you what I learned from that, because I think it applies to us as we're building digital product businesses. There's a lot of similarities. Lesson one, choosing the right customer is more important than what you sell. Let me illustrate. Snowboarders, oh, sorry, put it another way. Snowboarders are fun to hang out with, but they make shitty customers. And here's a picture that will tell you everything you need to know about my customers. This is Fockler. That's his real name. And he was my buddy, snowboard buddy. Uh, used to hang out, great snowboarder. But uh, he, uh, does it look like this guy has money? No. He spent all of his money basically on food and a lift ticket. He was like a ski bum. Now, believe it or not, I hired this guy. <laughs> and we have all sorts of stories about Fockler, but one I'll tell is we had this like high kind of rafters area. And one day I went up to like clean it and I saw a sleeping bag, a pipe, and some Doritos. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on here? And I realized that Fockler was living in the snowboard shop. So, if you're trying to sell $800 snowboards, not a great customer. Who you sell to matters a lot. Lesson two, starting small is almost always better than going big. And you know, like when I was dreaming as a teenager about having a shop, this is what I pictured. You know, fancy lights, nice fixtures, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of inventory. But in truth, I should have started like this, hawking snowboards out of a van or a truck or something. Because 
The lessons you learn when you start small are, and what you experience when you start small just gets magnified when you go big. So you get to discover, do I like this customer? What's it like serving a bunch of Focklers? You know, what's it like ordering all this inventory? You get to experience all of that when it's small and the stakes aren't as high. And so if you decide to get out, like, I don't like this, it hasn't cost you as much, right? And this is, I, I'm going to quote Derek Sivers a lot. He's basically, you don't li need to listen to me, just bring up Sivers.org and read that while I'm talking. Uh, but he has this quote, for an idea to get big, it needs to start small. Lesson three. I think the way we start businesses historically is wrong. And, you know, this is kind of the way I started the real deal, right? Biz plans pro. This, is, this has been around forever. You have a dream, you launch it, and then you make money, right? That's the idea. And this has been around for a long time, and we've started to figure out, ah, this doesn't always work. This isn't always effective. So we've, we've modified it a bit. It's evolved. So we went to Biz Plans Pro 2000. And now it's like, have a good idea, validate it, launch it, and then you make money. But even this is not enough. And this is what I mean when I say, I think I'm going to present an unconventional way to validate your product idea. It's not enough to have an idea, do a bit of validation, and launch it. You need more than product market fit. That's kind of my thesis for this whole talk. And I think you actually need three things. Market founder fit, product market fit, and founder, sorry, product founder fit. So market founder fit is exactly that. Who are my customers? Do I like them? Are they easy to reach? Are these people that I want to serve every single day for the rest of my life, right? Product market fit, that's what we all want. That's what we're all looking for. You know, it's having a good market and then finding a product that satisfies that market. And then the third one, a lot of people don't think about this. Product founder fit. Is this product a good fit for what I want? Is it a good, does it match up with my values? Does it get me where I want to go? All right? I put this in here to remind me to breathe. Doing a lot of meditation these days, trying to calm myself down. All right, that's enough talking about me. I'm going to quickly talk about you folks here. Why are you here? I want you guys, this is audience participation. You're going to put up your hands when I ask you. So how many of you are here because you want to find a product idea? Put up your hands, nice and high. Nice and high, don't be shy. All right, put them down. How many of you are here because you need to choose a target market? Put up your hands. Nice and high. All right, put them down. How many of you are here because you want to validate your product idea that you already have? Put your hands up. Okay. Man, there's a lot of participation over here. I don't know what's going on over here. <laughs> I only got one more, so you guys better lift your hand. How many of you are here, you've launched, but you want more customers? <laughs> all right, all right. So I'm going to try to help all you folks with a product validation roadmap. And it's based on all my years of experience doing SaaS. It's based on my two years being solo. But it's also, I think we have an interesting time in my history because I've just launched a new SaaS with my buddy John called Transistor.fm. So I've got some history, I've made some mistakes, I've learned some things, and now in some ways I'm right where a lot of you are at because I'm launching this brand new thing. So this is going to be a step-by-step -step approach for identifying who you are and what you want, choosing a market, discovering what they want, and shipping a solution. Are you guys ready? Does this sound good? You guys are with me? How about you right there? Are you with me? Okay, good. Here we go. Section one, you might want to bring out some paper and a pen for this because I'm going to ask you some very personal questions. Um, question number one, what's your motivation? for wanting to build a product. I've been doing these coaching calls where people call me, they pay to call me, and what they want often is they want me to validate their product idea, which is a bad idea. 
I got on a call the other day with this kid. He's a handsome kid, you know, curly hair. And uh, I said, okay, well, what are, you, what are you doing? He's like, well, I want to do arbitrage for a cryptocurrency. And I'm like, I have no effing idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I'm your, I am not your target market. But what I could ask him is, what do you want? What do you want to get out of this? What's your motivation? And if you haven't written this down, I want to build a product so that I can, what? You want to quit your job? You want to spend more time with your kids? You want to snowboard more? You want to, I don't know, travel more? You want to have more wealth? What do you want? Because there's no sense in going through this whole product validation process if you don't know what you're aiming for. And you'll never know if this product is a good fit for your life unless you've uh, written this down. So write this down. I want to build a product so that I can blank. Question number two is what do you value? James Clear has this great uh, list of core values. You can go there to get the full list. But, you know, creativity, impact, integrity, adventure, family, wealth, spirituality, peace. What do you value? And this is important because you want to make sure this matches up with whatever product you decide to pursue or what market you try to pursue. If you want peace, don't serve a bunch of marketing jackasses like me, right? We're going to make your life chaotic. Here's another question people don't ask very often. How rich do you want to be? And it's important, you know? Do you want to be very wealthy? Are you shooting for a million dollars a year? Higher than average, 300K a year? Financially secure, 150K a year? Maybe you just need your basic needs met, 50K to 100? Write this out. What are you aiming for? Okay, so we've just talked about you. Talked about what you want. And the next stage, instead of just saying, you know, I want to do this, or I have an idea to do this, I'm going to advise that you choose the group you want to serve. Who do you want to serve? A great business isn't really about you and your dream. That was the problem with the real deal. That was my dream. It was all about me. A great business is about helping your customers achieve their dreams, right? So don't start with an idea. Start with a group of people you want to help. And you really need to do this. <laughs> Figure out who you want to serve. And here's a little tip. This is something I've learned recently, just talking to a lot of founders, being involved in a lot of SaaS businesses, doing a lot of consulting. Some markets are just bigger, easier to reach, and more profitable than others. So it pays to think about this. It pays to do some research now before you launch anything. And here's a few ideas for finding your market. All you folks that put up your hand for looking for a target market. How do you currently make a living? What kind of customers do you serve at work? You know, these are the people already paying for your expertise. What communities do you belong to? What do you do better than anyone else? Those are like good like, places to look. If you're already in the banking industry as a Laravel developer, well, you've got the banking industry, they're already paying you, and you're also a part of the Laravel community, right? Here's an example, Ian Landsman. I like Ian. There's a few people in this community that just will not put up with my bullshit, and Ian's one of them. Uh, but he got the idea for Help Spot when he was working at a college, because their support desk system was a mainframe with a terminal connected to it, and it was all like command line based, and it was just a pain, and he thought, there has to be some, a better way to do this. And so he built something in the browser, he called it Help Spot, and guess who his first customers were? Colleges and universities. Why? He was working for a college. In a, he was working for a college. So the, the, uh, where you work can often be a good place to start. Factors to consider. How do they spend money? Do they spend money? How big is the market? And how easy are they to reach? Here's another great example. Bjorn Forsberg, he decided to target Shopify stores. Why? 
There's 500,000 plus stores paying $29 to $299 a month. That's a good market. We know it's big. We know they spend money. And we also know that on average, they spend another $30 per month on add-ons in the Shopify app store. So Bjorn built a couple uh, Shopify apps, and he's doing about $275,000 in revenue every year. A lot of it is that he chose the right market. How easy are they to reach? I'll use Adam Wathen. He's speaking right after me. But uh, Adam Wathen's got a great market. Really, it's PHP developers, specifically those that want to learn Laravel. But that's a lot of people. And are they easy to reach? Yeah. Uh, Adam says that a lot of his business comes from Twitter. So he can hang out on Twitter, and he has a direct channel to his market. There's also events like Laracon, where he can go and he can meet them face to face. There's online communities like Laracasts. So you want to make sure your market is easy to reach, right? If, you're, if your market's, uh, I don't know, Tibetan monks uh, who don't use computers, it might be tricky, right? All right, section three, this is the one everyone wants to skip, customer research. Now you've chosen your market, now you've got to research them. What are the big pain points that already exist in this market? So Bjorn was like, man, it's really hard to print shipping labels for Shopify stores. So that's the first app he made. How did he figure that out? He was in the forums day after day after day, and he noticed it kept kind of bubbling up. What are the things that are bubbling up, simmering in the community or the market you're targeting? What do they search on Google? You know, what, are, what kinds of questions are they asking every day? There's a few tools you can use. Uh, to figure some of this stuff out. Productvalidator.com is a brand new one. Answer the Public is another one. Hrefs is another one. But this is what Product Validator looks like. I put in podcasting, I go to the Questions tab, and then it gives me a bunch of common, frequently asked questions. These are helpful, you know? And there might be some pain points in here I want to address. And I'm, this is what I'm asking. The other thing you should do that no one wants to do. I'm, I am extroverted as hell. I've been here since Sunday for growth. I have not stopped talking since then. Even I don't like getting on the phone and interviewing customers. I know it's hard, or potential customers. But you have to do it, because the, the information you get while you're on the phone with someone, just, it doesn't compare to anything you could maybe get on just watching people on Twitter or guessing. You actually get them on the phone. Uh, here's a few things that have worked for me. They might not work for you, but I write case studies for my blog, and I, that's a great way to get someone on the phone. Hey, I want to do a case study on you uh, for my blog. Can we do a phone call? Uh, here's one. I, this is an email I wrote Peldy. Uh, I was writing a book, and I wanted to feature him. It's just a great excuse to get him on the phone, right? And so we had a Skype conversation, and uh, I was able to ask him some of these questions. Hey, what are you working on right now? What's something you're looking to improve with, in his case, balsamic this year? What's something you'd like to accomplish but can't? What's holding you back? Oh, this number three, just write number three down, because it shows so much. What was the last product, service, or tool you bought for work? If they can't think of something, then maybe they don't buy products. And maybe that's a bad market, right? But they're like, hmm, I can't remember. Well, hmm. What's your least favorite tool that you have to use right now? What kind of tasks are you currently doing in Excel? That's a really good one. And what product do you wish existed but doesn't yet? And again, you're just looking for the trends, what keeps coming up over and over again. Uh, this is an example from MicroConf. I type GDPR into Slack, and a bunch of things pop up. It's a hot topic. You can see the pain, right? People are struggling with this. And so if you are a compliance person or whatever, maybe this is a good thing for you to focus on. It might be a bit late now, but this is what I'm saying. Like, these are the, the examples you're looking for. 
Oh, yeah, also in forums. Uh, this was a coaching client I had. He's like, sorry, I have to cancel. I have to wait until after this GDPR hell. You know, it just keeps it coming up over and over and over again. You're like, man, there's something here. So then you summarize your research. What patterns emerged? What would you say? This is a patio 11 thing. He says, focus on the number one or two thing that is on someone's mind. It's like they wake up that week and they're going to work and they're like, oh, I got to solve this and I got to solve this. Or this thing's in my way and this thing's in my way. Those are the things you want. And what would it mean for them if you solved that struggle? What would it mean for you, them if you solved that struggle? Even just looking at that now, it connects to the human beings, right? We're not just putting apps out into the world. We're solving problems for real human beings, like real people that get up and put on a shirt and get into their car and drive to work. Like those are the people we're serving, right? Okay, section four, uh, write out your hypothesis. And I've, I had a version of this last year, and I improved on it. So if you came back, this is a better version of the one I gave last year. This group wants this outcome, but struggle with this thing. I can help them by, and then you just daydream. What are some ways I could help them with what I have right now? Like, how could I help these people? And if I did, what would their life look like after? So just using podcasting as an example, you know, many tech businesses want a branded podcast, but they struggle with getting listeners. I can help them buy, and then I just start daydreaming. Ah, oh, improving their show art and description, getting them more ratings and reviews, making their episodes easier to share. What would their life look like? Well, now their podcast has more downloads, and their business has more brand awareness, right? Section five. Are you guys still with me? Everyone still awake? Feeling good? All right. Start helping now. Again, Derek Sivers, the sage. If you want to be useful, you can always start now with only 1% of what you have in your grand vision. Doesn't this sound like something? Like the real deal a little bit, you know, the snowboard shop? It'll be a humble prototype version. It'll be a humble prototype version of your grand vision, but you'll be in the game. And so I want you to ask, what's the smallest possible thing you could do that would validate your hypothesis? So here's, again, here's my hypothesis, right, for podcasting. Okay, what could I do now? Well, I could start a consulting service, right? I could start DMing people and say, hey, I heard you want to start a show. Uh, I'm really good at writing titles and descriptions and making show art. What if you pay me, I don't know, 400, and 400 bucks for that, and I'll do that for you, right? That's something I could do right now. No code needed. No funding needed. I could create a video tutorial and I could sell it for 39 bucks. I could do that right now. I could create a WordPress plugin that pulls in reviews and ratings from around the world and shows it in a WordPress site. Pretty simple, not too much work, right? I could create a podcast title tester, right? Just a simple utility, maybe something I could build in a couple days or a week. What could I build right now that might test this out? And this is just so true. Everyone wants to jump to big, big, big. But starting small puts 100% of your energy on actually solving real problems for real people. Human beings, these people you're going to serve. All right. After you've done this, if you actually do this, by the way, if you actually do this, you will have results. You at least have some information about whether you should keep going or not. And now you can evaluate results. What does initial validation look like? You put something like this out into the world. So if I said, hey, um, I'll do your show titles and descriptions, and you pay me, that's pretty good validation. I know that there's people out there that are willing to pay for that kind of service. Uh, Pre-orders are pretty good, too. Email address is kind of like the bare minimum. If you can get someone to give you your, their email address, that's pretty good validation. I like this quote, too, because, you know, a lot of people try to ask folks for what they want, and the truth is people can't really articulate what they want. It takes a lot of research. You've got to do a lot of observation. You've got to read between the lines. You've got to interview, but when you interview, you have to say, Ask questions like, well, what was the last product you bought for work? How did you find it? Those kinds of things. 
A great example of this from microconf lore is Jason Cohen of WP Engine. Um, and as the story goes, before he built WP Engine, he'd done his research, he'd chosen the market, he'd observed all these struggles, and then he thought, okay, how am I going to validate this? So he would go and pitch this to people, just like you and I would, like, hey, I got this idea to build WordPress, a WordPress hosting system that's scalable, that doesn't crash when there's a bunch of traffic, that has really good security, um, you know, it'll automatically disable plugins if they get infected. Would you pay for this? And if they said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd totally pay for this. He'd say, okay, can you write me a check right now for your first month? And he didn't cash it, but having that validation of that check was like, okay, I'm on the right track. People are willing to write me a check for something that doesn't exist, right? There's some other trends you can also look for. They're not quite validation, but they're good signals. What's your target market investing in? So in the podcasting space, I noticed Rework, I mean, sorry, Basecamp just launched this Rework podcast hired two full-time people and built a podcast studio in the office. I'm guessing it's like 200 grand a year. That's a pretty big investment, right? That's a good sign. Uh, what's getting a lot of publicity right now? You gotta be careful with this, but sometimes, you know, the publicity is a good sign that there's something happening. There's something bubbling underneath the surface. And what are people struggling with? If you just keep seeing stuff over and over again on Twitter and Slack, Slack especially, if you're doing client work, how many of you are doing client work and you're in your client's Slack? Put up your hands. You got you put on your researcher hats and just see all the product decisions that are being made in Slack and note those down. They're talking about what they're gonna buy, right? How do they make those decisions? What are the struggles they're having in there? Okay, so I'm gonna summarize the process, and I wanna thank Rob Walling for coming up with a stair-step model. Uh, I've modified it a little bit, but this is Rob's original idea. At the base level, you start with a small free offering. Free tool, tutorial, resource, kind of what I said. If that works out, you go to the next level, right? Small paid offering, service, plug-in, workshop. If that works, go to the next level. Build a simple product that delivers value. If that works, go up to the next level, put more features in, charge more, do a bigger launch. And I'm gonna kind of wind down uh, and show you how this has worked with Transistor. And I think I'll have some time for questions. So if, you ha if you've had questions so far that you've noted down about product validation, note those right now, because I think I'll have some time for questions. So here's how this worked for Transistor. Uh, first of all, I had a built-in advantage. Remember at the beginning when I said, who are you? Right, like what are your strengths? What are your values? What do you want? Well, one of my strengths and advantages is I was already podcasting. I've been podcasting since 2012. This is my first show I did with Kyle Fox called Product People. This is my new show called Mega Maker. And uh, I just launched another show called Build Your SaaS, which is actually a terrible name because people can't tell if it's like SaaS as in sassy or uh, it doesn't work audibly as well. But I had, this is an advantage, you know, I've been podcasting for a long time. I had already seen some of the trends, some of the struggles. And I also noticed something else that was really interesting. So I eventually, I was getting a lot of people requesting uh, like phone calls, Skype to pick my brain, and it just became too much. And so I came up with this rule. I said, uh, I live, so I live in British Columbia, not in Vancouver. I live like right in the middle of nowhere, like mountains and trees. And, and I said, if you make it to Vernon, BC, I will buy you a coffee. And it just cut down on all the requests quite a bit. But surprisingly, a lot of people have done this. Already in 2018, I think I've had four people do this. And some people fly in for it, it's crazy. And in each case, I'll take them out for coffee, we'll sit down, and they'll look at me, and they'll go, Justin, this is so weird. <laughs> I say, well, why? And they say, I've been listening to you for years, and I feel like I have a relationship with you, but we've never talked. And that trend 
that the fact that it impacted people like that, that podcasting impacted people like that, made me feel like, huh, there might be something here. Maybe this is worth, worth investing in as a product. It motivates people. There's something going on here. The other thing I noticed is when I launched Marketing for Developers, 75% of the people who bought were podcast listeners. I, did, how many of you have ever listened to a podcast that I've done? I just want to see. Oh, holy shit. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Um, so it's a powerful medium. So before I even got to base level, I already had some experience. I had some ground level experience, right? Then I started doing some blog posts and tutorials on podcasting, and they did really well. In fact, uh, most of my stuff isn't very SEO friendly, but the stuff I was doing in podcasting was getting a lot of search traffic. So I was like, oh, this is good. This is a good sign. Uh, after that, I graduated to doing uh, some paid courses around podcasting, some paid courses around doing branded content. That was doing really well. And then I just noticed this trend of all these businesses launching podcasts. Startup. This is essentially a branded content piece for Gimlet Creative, right? I'm sorry, Gim Gimlet Media. Uh, CodePen has a podcast. There's all these tech companies that are starting podcasts. It's, the, it's a new channel for them. And then in uh, the growth conference, Brian Castle was saying 64.35%, that is so uh, precise, uh, of his customers <laughs> came from hearing him on a, on a pod, uh, podcast. Really good signs. All right, so we're noticing, okay, there's some movement here. We've got some initial validation. Oh, people are willing to pay for this. Well, people are investing a lot of money in branded podcasts. So then we built an initial version of Transistor.fm. Uh, we did it in about six weeks. I say we, but John built it. Um, and then we sold one paid plan to Cards Against Humanity. And a lot of people say, how did you get this customer? Well, John works for Cards Against Humanity, right? That goes back to what I was saying. Where are you, who's already paying you for your time and expertise? So this was a great first customer to have. This, customer, this uh, show's done really well. They've done about 3 million downloads since they launched. And the feedback was so good that we said, okay. Oh, and the other trend that we noticed, this kind of came up while we were doing this, uh, Google is now uh, ranking uh, and crawling audio so they're, they're transcribing it in the background and then showing it in search results. And if you're on Android, they'll actually show you the audio episodes in search results too. That's a good sign for branded content, right? Do you get a sense of how I'm like kind of layering this up? Like, man, this looks good, this looks good, this looks good. And so uh, after all of that, we decided to add some more features add some billing features, like be able to charge people without sending them an invoice, and then open up early access. And we did that in the last two months. Um, this is kind of what the product looks like today. And uh, this is what our early access invites look like. And this is my last slide. We're, right now, we have about 56 people. John told me to turn off the early access. We were getting too many. So we had 56 early access customers. They have to put their credit card in, and already there's a 14-day trial, and already 39 people have converted to paid plans. And so that's how we validated Transistor so far. And that's it. That's all I got for you. Thanks for listening, guys. Oh, I should say, um, I've got my slides here. And if you want more in-depth, if you, I go beyond this for uh, in terms of you get initial validation and then you build your MVP, et cetera, productvalidationchecklist.com. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Is there any questions about any of that process? Put up your hand if you do and then pass around the mic. Questions for Justin? Anything? Everyone knows exactly what to do. Everyone knows what to do now. Justin, who's your favorite American podcaster? <laughs> Adam Clark, for sure. Uh, Adam's got a great show, by the way, Gently Mad. You guys should check it out. 
I didn't have a real question. Yeah, no, that's great. That's um, great. So, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. You go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. All right. Um, <laughs> what do you, uh, so if you've launched something new, you've already got it going, like in my situation, I've already got a handful of customers, and you're saying all this stuff, and I'm like, man, those are really good ideas. Why didn't I do those things? <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, you've already got some traction. You know, I've already got some movement that yeah. seems like, Okay, so this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, is it worth going back and, uh, I don't know, applying some of those? Or, I don't know. Is it worth if you're already two months in with six to ten customers and you feel like things are going good, is it worth going back and doing any of those things that you just said? Yeah. I think it is because there's just so much future pain, uh, especially if you don't figure out the personal questions. What do I want? What do I value? How much money do I want to make? Uh, because if this thing keeps growing and it doesn't match up with your values, um, there's just story after story of people who just ended up in a lot of pain because of that. So I think it's worth going back. And you might still have time to do some little pivots right now with what you're doing to make conscientious decisions so that you know, this does match up with my values. I'll tell you a quick story about this. I had a guy that was in charge of the legal gambling for British Columbia. Like he was uh, the operator that did all the games and everything. And then he, uh, India came to him and said, we have a rampant like illegal gambling problem here. We need somebody to come and like do legal gambling in India. And they said, I think normal operator costs are like 0.5% of revenue. Like they get 0.5% of revenue. India said, we'll give you 30% of revenue the first year. And then down to 20, 10, like it was insane. And he's like, Justin, you're a good dude. You should come work with me on this startup. And I thought about it, I'm like, and he's like, it's gonna be a lot of money, you know, it's gonna, and I just couldn't see myself coming to MicroConf and people saying, what do you do? And me going, well, I do gambling in India, you know? Um, it just didn't, and that might be fine for some people, but it didn't match up with my values. And so I think asking those questions at whatever stage you're at, you can almost have to keep asking them forever. Like, does this still match up with what I want? Does this still match up with my values? So I think it's worth doing that work, right? Hi, Justin. Hey. Uh, great presentation, and congrats on your success as Transistor so far. Thanks. Um, I, this is maybe a dumb question, but I'm just going to ask it. Um, is B2B, B2C SaaS always a bad idea? Oh. Um, I mean, the, the common answer is yes, but there's, there's definitely people that make it work. I should have actually said that. A lot of what I'm talking about applies to B2B. Just because it's so, like when you're working with consumers, it's, it's more uh, like what do they desire, you know? Like look at the SaaS that, or the recurring revenue businesses that really work. It's like Netflix. It's almost always um, Spotify, Apple Music. There's a few exceptions, but it's almost always like some sort of desire, right? It's just harder to deliver that, especially if you're a bootstrapper. Now, prosumers, I think, are a little bit different, right? So if you have a prosumer market, that can sometimes work. But uh, one thing, like decision we made with Transistor is, um, I used to say the podcast market was terrible because it's all DIYers and hobbyists, right? They like, want to do it themselves, they don't have very much money. What, one of the reasons I decided you know, to pursue Transistor was that I saw all of this movement with companies investing in podcasts. And uh, to me, that's just a better market. I can charge more, um, they're not as finicky, honestly. Um, when I started in SaaS, we had a, we had a $10 product for kind of consumers, prosumers, and we had a hundred dollar product for industry. They're essentially the same, and we got five times more support requests from the ten dollar product. Same product, same functionality, but just way more support load. So, those would be some things to consider for sure. Um, <clears throat> hey, hey, Justin, hey. I'm gonna fly to uh, British Columbia, so I guess I will take you up on the coffee mm. in, in June. Yeah, come on down. Um, so my question is, um, can you talk about 
talk a little bit about you, when you formulate your hypothesis. Um, did you have parameters for failures, and how did you come up with those? So is there like a time period where you go, well, I'm going to talk to X number of people, mm. and in the next Y months, yeah. uh, Z needs to happen. Obviously, yeah. I'm Canadian. That's why it's Z. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How do you say JavaScript? Get him, get him back on the mic. Make him say it. Um, JavaScript? Oh, see, now you're wrong. <laughs> um, so uh, the only benefit of launching 100 things in a year is you get a sense for what kind of works and pops. And so uh, obviously I'm different than you. I'm different than, we're all different, right? And for me, it's much more of a feeling now because I worked in SaaS for a long time. Then I launched a bunch of things you know, in the past couple of years. I've seen kind of what worked. And I've had all of these consulting calls now. And I've been able to see a big range of things. And I can almost say, whoa, wow. If, for example, if I don't get 500 people to a waiting list for uh, like a landing page and get them to sign up for the idea, I'm kind of like, oh, that's a bad sign for me. But it really depends on the market. It depends on a lot of things. So those general rules are difficult. But I've kind of over time developed a sense of, OK, is this working? And I think you can still do that. That's why starting small is so great. So let's just say you launch a landing page for an idea. You spell out, this is who it's for. This is what they're struggling with. This is how I'm going to help them overcome the struggle. And 200 people sign up. The first email you send them, I should have had this in my slides, uh, is, uh, this is from Joanna Weeb. I stole this question from her. What's going on in your life that brought you here today? Like, why did you sign up for a thing on the internet with your email address, right? There must be something going on. And those stories that you get back are so helpful. As you develop a relationship with those people that reply to your email, Eventually, you might be able to say, hey, if I did that work for you manually, would you pay me? If they say yes or no, you, you're going to get a kind of a sense. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's going to be hard for us, me to give like, just blanket rules, though, about like ah, failure looks like this or success looks like this. You really kind of have to feel it out for yourself. And a lot of it depends on you and what you want. Does that kind of help? Yeah, there, so there is some. Yeah, so for me, uh, my wife and I have four kids. I have to, I know the idea has to be big enough that I'm going to be able to support my family on it. That's one. How much money is kind of in this market? Um, what kind of price points are they already paying for similar things? So we're, I mean, and we still, we're validating this right now, but our idea is that what uh, WP Engine is to Bluehost we want to be to other podcast hosting applications. So we have an example of, oh, WP Engine launched this higher end service and people were willing to pay more for it. So there's some examples out there of, oh, people are really willing to pay this kind of money for this kind of service. And then just kind of general things like, yeah, if I don't get 500 people for a, like a landing page, I, I usually kind of pass on the idea, I move on. Thank you very much, Justin. Yeah, thanks guys.